The self-proclaimed professor against political correctness is now making more than $50,000 per month through online donors, and he's got big plans for the future. It isn't really about the right to decide. It's about the right to insist upon by force. Professor Jordan B. Peterson made national headlines last fall for refusing to use genderless pronouns, even appearing on this show. And I've been thinking about this political correctness issue for a long time, and it's been bothering me. His viewpoint caused controversy, but also gained him supporters who flocked to his YouTube channel, helping him rack up millions of views for his online lectures. Now, to subsidize his production costs, he's turned to the crowdfunding site Patreon. A number of people have been attempting to take me to task for the fact that my Patreon support has been, let's call it, overwhelmingly successful. Aiming to build on his online success, Peterson is setting his sights on an even bigger goal. I want to move genuine humanities education out of the universities where it isn't being taught anyways, as far as I can tell, online where people can access it freely. Jordan Peterson joins me now in studio. Good to see you again. Thanks for being here. Morning. Why start an online university? Well, because the technology is ready for it. That's the, that's the most important issue. There's absolutely no reason why high-quality education can't be made available to masses of people at low cost. So, and since that's possible, there's absolutely no reason not to do it. I mean, you say low cost, you're saying that uh, students would, what, only pay for their examinations? Is that, well, that would be, we're, we're not sure exactly how it would how it would run but the one possibility would be a monthly subscription that would help pay for the content but the primary source of revenue would be for on the accreditation end on the examination end for sure so how would this work for students what would they see what would they learn well uh, we would probably start with a list of the hundred hundred greatest books of western civilization i think we'd start it as a great books program and we're thinking about making a timeline imagine a timeline that stretches say from 3000 BC up to the present time that you could zoom in on and imagine lectures that would be available at different levels of resolution. So for example, you might have a lecture about the um, 2000 to 1000 BC and the major, uh, the major occurrences during that period that you could zoom in and get specialty lectures where the historical knowledge was detailed enough to provide information at that level of resolution. And then the content, I don't know yet. Um, I think getting the underlying technical structure right at the moment is more important than the content because I think content would generate itself if the incentive systems were set up properly. Why do you think this would work uh, more effectively than a uh, traditional university format? Because the traditional universities have abandoned the humanities. But They've become almost entirely corrupt as far as I can tell. But you are a tenured university professor at the University of Toronto. Yes. So how do you reconcile those two? Well, the, uni the university disciplines that still have some grounding in science seem to be, I would say, still intact. But the humanities, we know, for example, that in the United States, the ratio of Democrats to Republicans in the humanities is about 30 to 1. It's taken an unbelievable leftward tilt. And about 80% of humanities papers are never cited once. And the humanities have been dominated by a kind of postmodern neo-Marxist what would you call it, cult ideology since the 1990s, probably starting in the 1960s. And so they've abandoned their mission to students. Their mission should be to teach students to speak, to think, and to read, and to become familiar with the best of the world, fundamentally, so that they can hone their cognitive skills and operate effectively in the world. And I don't believe they're doing that at all. I think it's a scam pretty much from top to bottom, and it's a very expensive scam. So it's too top-heavy. It's going to topple. So would you continue to work at the University of Toronto sure. if you started at this, this online university platform? Yes, definitely. Yeah. Well, what's been the reaction from your colleagues? Oh, minimal. I mean, the reaction from the university to, to the political uh, turmoil that I was embroiled in was first negative and then I would say neutral, and now things seem to be just fine. My colleagues haven't really said anything either about the political turmoil, about this plan. So, but I don't think that the plan, the change, I don't think will come from within the universities anyways, because generally speaking, when there's a new technology introduced, it isn't the old systems that adopt it. They're not capable of operating in the new te technological world because it requires a new approach. And you might say, ask, well, why do I have the expertise to do that? And right. perhaps I don't, but I have worked on software development for 25 years, and I have some good partners and a lot of people who are interested in helping me with this. It seems like a lot of people, you know, $50,000 a month is a lot of money. Were you yes. surprised by that? 
I'm staggered daily by that. Of course, it's absolutely overwhelming. And that money goes to? Well, it goes to, right at the moment, one of the things that's helped funding is uh, I'm doing a series on the psychological significance of the biblical stories. And uh, I used that money to rent the Isabel Bader Theater up front for 12 weeks and to hire a film crew. And it goes in part to help me cover the costs of the videos that I keep making. And it also, well, that's fundamentally what it's doing at the moment. When do you expect this to be up and running? That's a very good question. I mean, we're going to start with a website in the next month and a half that will be designed to help students and their parents identify postmodern content in courses so that they can avoid them. So I've been working with a specialist in artificial intelligence who's written a script to, to discriminate between postmodern neo-Marxist course content and classical content in the sciences and the humanities. And so we'll have a consumer information website up in a month. And I'm hoping that over about a five-year period, a concerted effort could be made to knock the enrollment down in postmodern neo-Marxist cult classes by 75% across the West. So our plan initially is to cut off the supply to the people who are running the indoctrination cults. We'll be watching. Jordan Peterson, thanks for being here this morning. My pleasure. Here's a question. Well, I posed a Here's question a question. To let's let's have a real question. Yeah. Can men and women work together in the workplace? Yes, I, How I do, you do it. How do you know? Because I work with a, a lot of women. Right. Well, it's been happening for, what, 40 years? And, and things are deteriorating very rapidly at the moment in terms of the relationships between men and women. It's like we don't know if men and women can work together successfully. But in what in work, ways? Because right? like in, well, in, in like, the sexual like, harassment way. Because 40 years ago, I would have been, well, I, I don't know if, if I was a white man, I would have been Jacqueline's boss and I could have done whatever I, I wanted, right? And that there would be almost no recourse that, the, that a woman who was working under me would have. Now they have some recourse. I mean, is that, is that a... There was recourse back then, too. You could take people to the police. You could take, do you think that was happening a lot? I mean, like, I, no, I, I, I think guess it's I a just, dreadful thing to have to go to the police if I guess you're being I just sexually assaulted. If, but you, if you feel like, like there is a reduction in harm, right, that, I don't that feel things like. are bad. So you feel like right now the atmosphere in corporate workplaces is the exact same that it was 40 years ago? No, but I'm not, sure, I'm not saying that it's any better. It's not any better. Well, maybe it is. What, what is I guess, like, not to ask you to sort of prove a negative, but what, I, I think that there is plenty of evidence if you look at all the stories that are coming out. Do you, do you not feel like any of the stories that you've heard about what Hollywood is like? Do you feel like that's not evidence that this is a problem? Evidence that Hollywood is a problem? Yeah. Yeah, but when I look at Hollywood, all, all these people coming out of Hollywood talking about how sexual misbehavior is a problem, and I think... People in Hollywood are talking about that. They've been capitalizing on sexual misbehavior for like a hundred years. But that, I mean, look, those are unrelated in a are lot they? of ways. Yeah, like they're, I mean, they you as a professor should know like about correlation and causation. Like you're, you're basically saying, well, you know, there have been movies with sex in it. Therefore, a PA on the set of a movie, of course, should be expected to be sexually harassed. Well, no, I'm saying no, those two are those I'm two are separate worlds in, in any sort of pure logical sense. Like you're that that is just a classic mix up of correlation. And why are they separate there. worlds? We don't know how to draw the boundaries. Because so why? here's well here's the question. So we you could feel it, like any movie that has like if you talk about sex in your in your classroom or if you talk about sort of sexual behavior in your classroom, and another classroom does not talk about sexual behavior at all, you feel like your classroom would have a higher chance or higher incidence rate of sexual no, assault or harassment? No, but I would say that if I, if, I, if I was part of an organization that built entire dozens of careers on sexual provocativeness, I would be very careful about, like, waving the ethical flag in the sexual wars. So you think Hollywood doesn't exploit sex? Hasn't the feminist been saying that for 30 years? The entire en entertainment industry does nothing but exploit women sexually. Is that true or not? And if it is true, then aren't they contributing to the problem? And if they're contributing to the problem, but, but then you, where is all the ethical... But you're, but you're arguing at that point that Hollywood is one sort of totemic idea, that it is one sort of... That, that a woman who works in entertainment must then, like, pledge allegiance to this idea of a sort of totemic Hollywood and not come out and give her story. Like, you're saying no, that, I'm, like, I'm, if she that, 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 she, that she's, like, somehow complicit in all of it. The degree to which we're all complicit in what's going on is unspecified. I said already, you know, we don't know how to have an adult conversation about sex. It's not surprising. It's not the least bit surprising. I, so, I but I don't like. So then, th what is it then? Like, because you're th it's, this seems to be like the sort of collectivist uh, thinking that you rail against. You know, you're saying that Hollywood is one thing, and that Hollywood made its own bed, and therefore Hollywood should not speak about this issue because they're the ones that were pushing this agenda. No, it isn't that they shouldn't speak about it. 
Or that they, they should do speak not carefully have the moral about authority it. to They should speak, speak about carefully it. about it. Do you feel like they're not speaking carefully? Absolutely, they're not speaking carefully. Not, a, not, not in the least. What, what is out of control about it? Well, trial by public opinion, I suppose, is part of what's out of control about it. Trial by public opinion? Do you think yeah. that's what's happening? Yeah, to some degree, sure. It's, it's very easy for people to come forward with accusations and demolish someone's reputation. That's tr trial by public opinion. So, I mean, and we don't have a we don't have any conversation about the other side of the of the coin. You don't think women manipulate men sexually for advancement in the workplace? Do you not do you not think that there has been any sort of pushback against against this Me Too movement at all? Yeah, there's been some. Okay, so then then what do you mean we don't have conversations about the other side? It seems like every time I read any sort of publication, it's split more or less 50-50 and actually increasingly more towards like, maybe this thing is out of control. It seems like that narrative is certainly out there. Yeah, true. It, is, it has started to emerge in the last couple of weeks. That's true. Yeah. So the, I, I don't understand. I guess I don't understand the question exactly. Well, my question is essentially that like when, when you... Is there sexual harassment in the workplace? Yes. Should it stop? That'd be good if it did. That'd be good. Will it? Well, not at the moment, it won't, because we don't know what the rules are. Do you think men and women can work in the workplace together? I don't know. Without sexual harassment? We'll see. We'll see. How many years will it take for men and women working in the workplace together? More than 40. To get a sense. More than 40? Mm -hmm. We're new at this. We're new at this. Absolutely. We're completely new at it. It's only been a couple of generations. That's part of the problem, right? Is that we don't know what the rules are. Like, what? here's a rule. How about no makeup in the workplace? Why would that be a rule? Why should you wear makeup in the workplace? Uh, Isn't that sexually provocative? No. It's not? No. Well, what is it then? What's the purpose of makeup? Some people would like to just put on makeup. Why? To, 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 I don't know why. Why do you make your lips red? Because they turn red during sexual arousal. That's why. Why do you put rouge on your cheeks? Same reason. So your argument... I'm not saying that you shouldn't wear makeup. No, no, I'm not saying that. But you're saying that... that I'm when saying we don't know what the rules on are. Makeup in the workplace, that they have sexualized themselves in a way. That's what makeup's for. That would, Jesus, that would, that's self evident. That would, that Why would, else would you wear it? That, let me admit, when women put on makeup in the workplace, yeah. when they make their lips red, when they sort of put on rouge, yeah. right? That when they enter that workplace, if a man notices that, that there is sort of a complicitness with, with which the woman has said, I am going to sexualize myself in the workplace and therefore. Whatever comes will come. No, I didn't say the last part of that. So I didn't what, say what so whatever then? comes will come. But, but I think the issue of complicitness. How about high heels? I mean, look. How about high heels? What are they what for? What about high heels? What about them? They're there to, to exaggerate sexual attractiveness. That's what high heels do. They tilt your they tilt your pelvis forward so your hips stick out. That's what they do, and they tighten up your calf muscles. They're a sexual display. Now, I'm not saying that people shouldn't use sexual displays in the workplace. I'm not saying that. But I am saying that that is what they're doing. And that is what they're doing. So what is the relevance then to like sexual harassment in the workplace then if, if you can't make... Well, the Maoists put everybody in uniforms to stop that sort of thing from happening. Men wear uniforms. That's the way they wear suits. I, I guess I, I'm not seeing the sort of coherence of the, of the thought that you're putting together then because... What are the rules that govern sexual interactions between men and women in the workplace? Yes. The answer is, we don't know. Right. So I'm throwing out some questions. How about makeup? Oh, that's okay. Is it? Why? Why is it okay? Well, I would think that there's certain ownership over one's body that they can take without... How about negligees? <laughs> well, look, if you, that's had going a, too far. if you had a workplace with negligees, I think that there would be some sort of standard idea that maybe that would be a sexualized... Thing. Okay, so there's some line between lipstick and negligees that yeah. we don't want to cross. Okay, fair enough. Where exactly is the line? Well, I think that, you know, much like Justice Scalia said with pornography, it's something that you can feel or that you know it when, when you see it. I would say that that Maybe. that sort of, but it, you know, what's confusing to me for you know, and I really do just mean this in sort of a debate sense, which is that like, like these sorts of big collective ideas, they're they're things that you feel like are sort of derived through through evolution, that that people do come to a consensus that is meaningful. Um, I don't think that anyone would say that wearing makeup to the office is in some ways like sexually deviant or something like that, or that it's inviting a sort of atmosphere of sexuality within the workplace. I would say that. You the would second say that. part, sure. It's exactly what it's doing. 
Okay, Why so else would you wear lipstick? Complete the thought for me, then, because that's the part that I like for you to do. Like, complete the thought. A woman. I'm not saying that women shouldn't do it, and I'm also not saying that it should be banned. But I'm saying that you're absolutely naive if you don't think that that has anything to do with sexuality. Or Obviously, sexual harassment? Does it have something to do with sexual harassment in the workplace? I don't know. Because I don't know what the rules should be that govern the interactions between men and women in the workplace. I, mean, I, I don't believe should, that. Should people be allowed to flirt in the workplace? Do you feel that, let, let's just, yes or no question, do you feel like women wearing makeup in the workplace contributes to sexual harassment in the workplace? Sure, it contributes. And so what should be done about that? You as a clinician who believes that there should be prescriptive ideas that don't mandate behavior, but that will guide behavior. I don't know. I don't know what the answer to that is. Do you feel like women shouldn't wear, if, if, do you feel like a serious woman who does not want sexual harassment in the workplace, do you feel like if she wears makeup in the workplace that she is somewhat being critical? Yeah. Okay. I do think that. Okay, let's move on. I don't see how you could not think that. It's like makeup is sexual display. That's what it's for. You say, well, I want to look more attractive. It's like, what do you mean by attractive exactly? So then what is a better outcome for you then? A workplace with no sexual harassment, where women wear uniforms and don't wear makeup, much like the Maoists, like you were saying, or a sort of freer workplace in which sexual harassment is an inevitability because women wear high heels and makeup. Well, I don't say that sexual harassment is an inevitability because women wear high heels and makeup. I didn't say that. Or that it is more likely. I said that it, it contributes to the sexualization of the workplace. What's the difference between more likely and that? Okay, more likely. I'll go with that. Yeah, more likely, right? Sure, okay. Okay, so which one do you prefer? I don't prefer either of them. Oh, which one of those two would I prefer? Yeah. Oh, I prefer the one where people had the freedom. And so within that, so we've gotten to that point, that people should have freedom to wear makeup, right? But that that will inevitably lead to, not inevitably, that it is more likely that sexual harassment happens in the workplace. Does, isn't that sort of well, saying that if women wear, like, how is that not saying that if women wear makeup in the... In the that isn't what I said. Like, you're, you're pushing it past what I said by a substantial margin. Sure, I said that I, we don't understand the rules like, that I, govern the, the interactions in the, in the, between men and women in the workplace, right? Mm -hmm. We don't understand the rules. And so I was pushing a limit case. That's what I was doing. I wasn't saying women shouldn't wear makeup. No, I, I was, was saying we could have a question either, about, though. there should be a question raised about that. And there is often. I mean, companies have dress codes, let's say, you know, um, and they have a reason for that. But, but the fact that we got tangled up in this conversation is an indication of exactly how difficult it is to have a reasonable, reasonable conversation about exactly what rules should govern the interactions between men and women in the workplace. I would object to that a little bit because I think the reason why this conversation has been difficult is because like, there are certain things where you'll just punt and you'll say, I'm not saying that, and you'll try and be very hyper-specific. And now look, mm -hmm. there are examples of that where I feel like you were right. Like I feel like the Kathy Newman article or the Kathy Newman interview, I felt like a lot of what you're, what, that she put words in your mouth. I don't feel like I'm doing that. In fact, I've been extremely careful not I'm, to. I'm, I'm, and I'm, I'm definitely not accusing you of that. Okay, so. I'm I, just saying that these sorts of conversations are difficult, not that you're making it unduly difficult. Because okay. I don't think you are. Sure. So I, I guess, look, this is a, this is a test case, right? Like we, we are not here to say like, Jordan Peterson believes that this is true. We are talking about a specific test case. Like, we agree, or not we agree, yeah. you are arguing that, that makeup is sexualized, high heels are sexualized, yeah. right? When they enter a workplace, the workplace has a higher preponderance of becoming sexualized. Right? Yes. How is that, how do we not then take the next step and say that, ergo, if we want to get rid of sexual harassment in the workplace, that your belief is that women should not wear high heels or makeup in the workplace? Oh, because there's other potential solutions. People could, well, you could allow for a certain amount of sexual tension and not act on it in a reprehensible manner. I mean, look, if let's say you're married to someone, right? You go I am to a married, party. Yeah. Okay, you go to a party. Do you ever flirt? I mean, I don't go to parties. Oh, okay. Do you, do you ever flirt at all? No, honestly okay. not. But do you know how? But that is, uh, no, not really. Okay, well, I mean, like, so, like, like, so that's example. not so good. Yeah. Well, look, look, one of the things that's enjoyable about the interactions between men and women even if you're married, is an element of flirtatiousness that can underscore the interaction. Okay, you don't want to get rid of that. It's too tyrannical to get rid of that. But you're playing with fire. You have to know that you're playing with fire. 
And so there's going to be some sexual provocativeness in the workplace, let's say, both ways. But you're playing with fire. And you need to know what the rules are. We don't know what the rules are. Okay, how about what if I said it is okay to flirt with your coworker from time to time, but you know, don't don't grab them in the private. Well, that well, that, that seems, you know, I think we could agree that that might be a reasonable start, right? But then, of course, you still have the problem of exactly what constitutes acceptable flirting. Do you feel like the majority of people then who are sort of in this Me Too movement right now who have been speaking out, yeah. I mean, do you really think all of them are not a, are saying that you can't flirt at all? You know, mm -hmm. or do you think most of them are saying you just don't grab me in the privates because I would I, just as somebody who also has read about this, who studied yeah. it quite a bit, who has followed it very intensely, it really does seem like the message is like, hey, like you know, don't pull your robe off, don't grab me in the. No, boobs. I think it's worse if, than that. You do. Yeah, well, look at what happened with NBC. Now you're supposed to report your coworkers if you suspect them of romantic entanglements. That's been true about American, like I mean, you're, that is one symptom. But this is a policy now. It is. It's a, it's a policy, policy at one one company about sort of this industry wide yeah, about this industry wide problem. This, yeah, it's it's a it's a response to it, but it's a bad response. You said like, is it only about not being grabbed? It's like, no, it's not only about that. If it was only about not being grabbed, would you be okay with it? Well, I'm not in favor of people being involuntarily grabbed. I'm not in favor of sexual harassment or sexual assault, and not in the least. I don't, I think, I already told you what I think. I'm a sexual conservative. Sure. I don't think people should have sex on the first date. I think they should be very careful with sex, right? So I'm not in the camp of let's grab each other under the mistletoe at the Christmas party because what the hell? I'm not in that camp. 